Hi guys, it's time for chapter four. I know I said this last time and I will say it again, but this is one of my favorite chapters. It's called Froze Up Southern Folks and you might wanna get comfortable because this is one of the longer chapters. So sit back and relax. Chapter four. Because she'd been born in Alabama, mama didn't really know anything about the cold. Even though she'd lived in Flint for 15 years, she still thought cold weather could kill you in a flash. That's why me and Joey were the warmest kids at Clark Elementary School. Mama wouldn't let us go out on a cold winter day unless we were wearing a couple of t-shirts, a couple of sweaters, a couple of jackets, and a couple of coats, plus gigantic snow pants that hung on your shoulders by suspenders, plus socks and big black shiny rubber boots that closed with five metal buckles. We wore so many clothes that when we pulled our final coat on, we could barely bend our arms. We wore so many clothes that when Byron wasn't around, the other kids said stuff like, here comes some of them weird Watsons doing their mummy imp imitations. But the worst part of this was having to take all this stuff off once we got to school. It was my job to make sure Joey got out of her coats and things okay. So after I took all of my junk off, I went down to the kindergarten and started working on hers. Joey usually looked like a little zombie while I peeled the coats and jackets off of her. She got so hot inside all this stuff that when I finally got down to the last layer, she'd be soaking wet and kind of drowsy looking. I took her hood off and unwrapped the last scarf that was always around her head. When that last scarf came off, there was a real nice smell like Joey was a little oven and inside all those clothes, she baked up her own special perfume with the smell of shampoo and soap and the pomade mama put in her hair. That was the only part I didn't mind. I loved sticking my nose right on top of Joey's head and smelling all those nice things baked together. Mama always kept a little towel in Joey's last jacket pocket so I could make sure her face and hair were dry. Kenny, she said one time while I wiped the sweat from her forehead and hair, can't you do something to keep Mommy from making us get so hot? I tried, Joey. Mama thinks she's protecting us from the cold. I started trying to get Joey's shoes out of her boots. Whoever invented these boots should be shot because once the boots got a hold of your shoes, they wouldn't let them go for anything. I pulled everything off Joey's foot and gave her the boot while I reached my hand inside to tug on the shoe. We pulled and pulled, but it seemed like the harder we pulled, the harder the boot sucked the shoe back in. Maybe Byron will help make Mommy stop if we let him know how hot we get. Joey was too young to understand that Byron didn't care about anything but himself. He was kind of nice to her, though, and didn't treat her like he treated me and other kids. We tugged and tugged, and the shoe started coming out an inch at a time. Finally, it made that funny sound like water going down the drain and slid out of the boot. Phew! I tied Joey's shoes back on her feet and used her towel to wipe my own forehead. I couldn't wait until I was old enough to not listen to what Mama told me. The next morning, Mama was burying Joey in all her clothes again. Joey was doing the usual whining and complaining. Mommy, can't I wear just one jacket? I get too hot. And besides, when I wear all this junk, I'm the laughing sock of the morning kindergarten. Mama's hand came up to cover her mouth, but she got serious when she said, Joey, I don't want you to be the laughing sock, but I don't want you catching a cold. You've got to keep bundled up out there. It's colder than you think. This cold is very dangerous. People die in it all the time. Joey pouted and said, well, if they die in it all the time, how come we don't see any frozen people when we go to school? Mama gave Joey a funny look and pulled her hood over her head. Sweetheart, do what Mommy says. It's better to be too warm than too cold. Joey whined a little more while Mama put her boots on her. Me and Byron went outside and waited on the porch. He was trying to look cool, but I said to him anyway, Man, I hate taking all that stuff off Joey when we get to school. She whines and cries the whole time. I stood next to him and looked at him sideways. Seems to me like you got a real bad memory. Who you think took all that stuff off your little behind all those years? What goes around, goes around. I was surprised he said anything, since Byron thought it was cool not to answer stuff when someone younger than you said it. But he wasn't being completely nice. While I was talking, he kept moving around me, so if I wanted to look at him sideways, I'd have to move too. It must have looked like we were doing some kind of square dance, with me moving around like one foot was nailed to the porch. Yeah, but I didn't cry and whine. Byron kept circling me and put his hand behind his ear. What? I know you didn't say what I think you said. You were the cryingest little clown there ever was. 
With Byron walking around me like that, we must have looked like we were in the Wild West, and I was a wagon train, and Byron was the Indian circling, waiting to attack. Byron changed directions and started going around the other way, and I acted like my other foot was nailed to the porch and started following him sideways that way. I knew there wasn't much point saying a whole bunch more to him, so I said, mostly to myself, Man, I hate listening to Joey whining when I take all that junk off her at school. Well, listen here, he said. I'm going to help you out. I know it's kind of stupid to think that someone who's teasing you by going around in circles is going to help you out, but I said anyway, how? He kept going around and around me. I bet we looked like the solar system, with me being the sun and Byron being the orbiting Earth. I'll talk to Joey. You know, kind of put her mind at ease. This didn't sound too good. And I got sick of by teasing me, so I let the Earth orbit by itself. Joey finally came out, and the three of us walked toward the bus stop. Byron started right in. Baby sis, I know you don't like wearing all them clothes, right? Right, Byron, they get too hot. Yeah, I'm hip. But you know there's a good reason why you got to have all that stuff on. Why? Only me and Kenny wear this much junk. Yeah, but what you don't know is that Mama's only doing what's right. There's something she don't want you two to know yet. But I know you some real mature kids, so I'm going to tell you anyway. Okay, tell us. I wanted to know too. Even though I was in fourth grade, I fell for a lot of the stuff Byron came up with. He made everything seem real interesting and important. All right. But when Mama finally do tell you guys this stuff, you gotta act like you surprised. Deal? Both me and Joey said, deal. Byron looked around to make sure no one was listening, then said, have you ever noticed early in the morning some of the time you wake up and hear garbage trucks? Yeah. And have you noticed how when you get up and go to school, you almost never see them trucks? Yeah. And have you ever noticed how when you do see one of them trucks, it got a real big door in the back of it that opens and shuts so you can't see what's inside? Yeah. And have you noticed how that door is too big for even the biggest garbage can in the world? Yeah. And Joey, did you notice how Mama got kind of nervous and didn't answer your question about not seeing people being froze up on the street? Yeah. Byron looked around and made us get real close to him. Okay. Now, this is the part you're going to have to look surprised at when Mama tells you about it. But before I tell you, you're going to have to practice acting surprised so I don't get in trouble for letting you know, okay? Yeah! Kenny, you first. I made my eyes get real big and threw my mouth open. Not bad, but try it with some sound. I made my eyes get real big, threw my mouth open, and said, What the? Perfect. Baby sis, your turn. Joey did exactly what I did. That's Good, but I think we need some action. Do all that stuff and throw your arms up like you just heard some real shocking stuff. We did. Cool. Now do it together three times. Go. Me and Joey did it three times. Then Byron said, listen real careful. He looked around to make sure the coast was clear. There's a good reason Mama makes you wear all them clothes. And it's got to do with them big doors on the back of the garbage trucks. Dig? Me and Joey nodded our heads the best we could with all those clothes on. You see, some of them trucks ain't real garbage trucks at all. Joey, you were right. Every cold morning like this, the streets is full of dead, froze people. Some of the time, they freeze so quick they don't even fall down. They just stand there froze solid. Joey was believing every word. I wasn't too sure. But you notice that not everybody gets froze like that. It's just them folks from down south who got that thin, down-home blood who freeze so quick. And you know Mama ain't from Flint. She grew up in Alabama, and that means half of y'all blood, y'all's blood is real thin. So Mama's worried that one morning it's going to be cold enough to freeze you all. That's where them fake garbage trucks come in. Every morning they go around picking the froze folks off the street, and they need them big doors because someone who got froze don't bend in the middle, and they wouldn't fit in no regular ambulance. Joey looked like she was hypnotized. Her mouth was open and her eyes were bugging. But both of you got to swear never ever to try and look in the back of one of them trucks. I did it once, and I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing more horrible than seeing hundreds of dead, froze-up southern folks crammed up inside a garbage truck. It's a sight that I'm going to carry to my grave with me. So, Joey, don't be crying and whining when you put them clothes on. It would break my heart to see my own family froze solid so they got thrown in one of them fake garbage trucks. Joey started crying. Byron told me, 
give my regards to Clark Poindexter, and left me there to wipe Joetta's tears. I've got to admit, Joey didn't do any more whining when she had to get into her winter clothes. The only good thing about Mama being afraid of the cold was that we were the only kids at Clark who got to wear real leather gloves. Most of the other kids had to wear cheap plastic mittens that would start to crack up after two or three snowball fights or one real cold day. Some of them had to wear socks on their hands and some of them just had to scrunch their arms up in the sleeves of their jackets. But Mama made sure we got real leather gloves with real rabbit fur on the inside of them. And I'm not bragging, but we got to go through two pairs a year each. At the end of every winter, Mama and Dad would go downtown to Montgomery Wards when gloves were going on sale and buy six pairs for us kids. The only problem with having two pairs of gloves was that if you lost one pair, you had to wear the next pair kindergarten style. That meant Mama would run a string through the sleeves of your coat and tie two safety pins on the ends of the string. Then she'd pin your gloves to the string, and it was impossible to lose the gloves because every time you took them off, they'd just hang from your coat. I pulled a trick on Mama to help Rufus. For a while, I shared my first pair of gloves with him. I'd keep the right-hand glove, and he'd keep the left-hand one. That way, we could both get in snowball fights. And instead of Rufus scrunching both of his hands up in his sleeves, I'd scrunch one of mine, and he'd scrunch one of his. This was okay for a while, but then I figured that if I told Mama I lost my first pair, she'd give me the second one, and me and Rufus would each have a full pair of gloves. It worked! Mama put the second pair on my coat kindergarten style and warned me, This is the last one, Kenny. After this, you won't have anything for the rest of the year, so be careful. I just about broke out laughing when she held me by the arms and looked right in my eyes and said, Do you know what frostbite will do to you? Yes, Mama. I looked sad on the outside, but on the inside I was feeling great. I gave Rufus the right-hand glove and everything was fine for about a week. That's when my second pair of gloves, kindergarten strings, safety pins, and all disappeared out of the closet at school. Rufus had to let me borrow one of my old gloves back, and we were back to scrunching one hand each up in our coat sleeves. But since Rufus was now the official owner of the gloves, he got to keep the right-hand one, and I had to wear the left-hand one. Two days later, Larry Dunn stopped wearing socks on his hands and started wearing a pair of real leather gloves with real rabbit fur on the inside of them. The only difference between my old gloves and Larry's new ones was that mine had been brown and Larry's were black. Me and Rufus found this out when Larry ran up behind us and said, This is Friday, y'all. Time to do the laundry. Who's going to be first, Country Cornflake or Cockeye Kenny? He didn't wait for us to make up our minds and grabbed me first. He said to Rufus, If you run away during Cockeye's wash, I'm going to hunt you down and hurt you bad, boy. This ain't going to take but a minute, so just stick around. Rufus stood there looking worried. Larry wasn't like other bullies. He wasn't happy taking a handful of snow and smashing it in your face and running off. Larry gave what he called Maytag washes. With a Maytag wash, you had to go through all of the different cycles that a washing machine did. And even though when Larry gave you a Maytag, all of the cycles were exactly the same, each part had a different name, and the wash wasn't done until you went through the final spin and had snow in every part of your face. Ever since Larry got these new leather gloves, he was giving super Maytag washes because he could grind a whole lot more snow in your face for a whole lot longer since his hands weren't getting as cold. Larry was tearing me up. I was crying even before the first rinse cycle was done and he finally let me go. After he washed Rufus up, we started walking home and Rufus said, Man, he stole your gloves. Who didn't know this? But you couldn't prove it. And besides, my old gloves were brown and Larry's new ones were black. Uh-uh, mine were brown, I said. Rufus dug a chunk of snow out of his jacket and said, Look, the snow was covered with black. So was all of the snow I pulled out of my outer coat. Larry Dunn had stolen my gloves, then painted them black with shoe polish. I didn't know what to do. Sooner or later, Mama was going to notice I only had one glove. And ever since I'd found out that half of my blood was that thin southern kind, I started wondering if frostbite really could do some damage to my hands. I couldn't help myself. I sat on the curb and sniffled a couple of times and finally cried. Rufus knew this was some real embarrassing stuff, so he sat down beside me, looked the other way, and acted like he didn't see me crying. That's how come we didn't see Bai and Buckhead walk up on us. I was too busy looking down, trying not to be too obvious about crying, and Rufus was too busy pretending he didn't notice that I was. What you crying about, punk? 
I made the mistake of telling Byron about my gloves and Larry Dunn. Where's he at? Washing kids' faces over by the school. Come on. Me and Rufus followed by and Bup head over to Clark. Larry Dunn was giving a super May tag to a fifth grader. Byron interrupted the final rinse cycle and said, Let me see them gloves. Larry Dunn said, I ain't. By snatched Larry Dunn's windbreaker with one hand, then touched his own mouth with his other hand. Buphead, I thought for sure when I got up this morning that my lips was working fine, and now when I feel them like this, they seem like they moving just right. But if they working fine, how come this little fool ain't doing what I told him to do? Buphead shrugged and said, maybe the boy's ears is bad. Maybe, maybe I'm gonna have to use deaf people language to talk to him. Maybe I'm going to have to talk to him like that woman in The Miracle Worker. All the Weird Watsons had seen that show together, and the way they talked to deaf people in that movie wasn't anything like the way Byron was talking to Larry Dunn. Byron's style of deaf language was just to yell real loud and slap the side of Larry's head after each word. Lenny, see, them, gloves, young, fool. This had to be killing Larry Dunn. Larry didn't cry or anything. He just stared at By and said, I ain't. He talked real tough, but he didn't do a thing when Byron snatched the gloves off of his hands. The palms of the gloves were brown and the backs were black. Byron threw me the gloves. Here, Kenny. Thanks, Bye. That would have been fine with me, but Byron wasn't through. Come here, Kenny. I went and stood where Byron still had the neck of Larry Dunn's skinny little windbreaker wadded up in his fist. Pop him, Byron said. I gave Larry Dunn a slap on the arm. I'm going to only tell you one more time. Pop him. I hit Larry a little harder. I hoped he'd bend over and act like I killed him. But he stood there trying to look cool. Byron kept his word and only told me that one time. Then when I didn't hit Larry hard enough, By punched me in the stomach. Hard. I didn't even feel it because I had all those sweaters and jackets on. But I had more sense than Larry. I acted like I'd been popped by Sugar Ray Robinson. I staggered around, then fell on my knees holding my stomach. I said, oh. A little crowd of kids started bunching up around us, and Byron decided it was time to put on a show. I don't know why bullies always have such a good sense of humor, but they do. Unless you were the one who was in the machine, you'd probably think that Larry Dunn's Maytag washes were pretty funny. And unless it was your jacket that was balled up in Byron's fist with a crowd of kids bunching up, you'd have to say he was pretty funny too. I knew Byron wasn't trying to help me anymore. He was just being mean. Well, 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 Mr. Dunn, Bye said. Today's your lucky day. Bye dragged Larry over to the chain link fence that went all the way around Clark. You want to know why you so lucky today? Larry Dunn didn't say anything, so Byron grabbed his hair and jerked his head up and down a couple of times. I guess that means yes. The crowd of kids was getting bigger and bigger and was loving this. Not because they wanted to see Larry Dunn get jacked up, but because they wanted to see anybody get it. They'd have been just as happy if it was me or Rufus or someone else. Well, today's your lucky day, because I'm about to make a new movie. And guess what? You gonna be the star. Byron jerked Larry's arms over his head three times. Larry Dunn was really tough. Not only because he wasn't crying when Bye was going to mess him up, but also because when Byron jerked his arms over his head like that, We all could see that Larry's skinny little windbreaker was ripped under both arms, and Larry just had on a t-shirt underneath it. You'd have to be pretty tough to stand around giving people Maytags on a day as cold as this with those skimpy clothes on. Hmm, I guess that means you're real excited about being in my flick. Yeah, Bai said, but I got some even better news for you. Bai lifted Larry up in the air and threw him. Larry landed on his butt. Someone shouted, look at them shoes! the crowd cracked up. Larry Dunn's tennis shoes had holes in the bottom, and he'd put pieces of cardboard box in them to cover the holes. Byron snatched him back to his feet. Look at that! You so excited about being in my movie, you jumping for joy. Don't you even want to know what it's about? Larry's head got jerked up and down again. Okay, it's called The Great Carp Escape. I hated watching this. Byron was the only person in the world who could make you feel sorry for someone as mean as Larry Dunn. The Great Carp Escape was about a carp that was trying to get out of a net in the Flint River. The stupid fish would run into the net, get knocked down, then get back up and run into the net all over again. 
since he was the star, Larry Dunn had to play the carp, and the fence around Clark was the net. The director of the movie, Byron, didn't like the way the scene was going and made the carp redo it over and over again. Let's see a little more fins this time, carp, Byron would say, then throw Larry into the fence. Since tennis shoes don't have a lot of grip on the ice, Larry would go into the fence hard and couldn't control what part of him hit first. I knew it really had to hurt to catch yourself on that cold fence with nothing on your hands, not even socks. But Larry Dunn was real, real tough. He had a bloody nose and still didn't cry. I wished I hadn't told Byron about what happened. I wished I could have just gone the rest of the year with one glove. I couldn't stand to see how the movie was going to end, so me and Rufus left. I could hear the jink jink sound of that carp hitting the net and the screams and laughs of the audience from half a block away.